clerk off is supposed to ask a silence place. Paris. That includes you, Chris. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome for uh, attending this uh, educational seminar. I guess it was a party, party, party night last night, uh, especially if you went to the auction. <laughs> it was a little wild. Uh, there's a few pictures on the uh, uh, chipboard. Uh, but meanwhile, we had fun. Uh, this morning, we have uh, a representative that works for our educational director. Uh, and most of you probably heard of uh, Ted Whiting. And uh, Ted works for uh, MGM Resorts International. And so they sometimes send him traveling. And in fact, that's increased a little bit. He told me last week that about this time today, he'd be having reindeer in Finland. I think he was in Finland. But anyway, so, so Ted's out here and he asked me to cover for him for the introductions on our seminar speakers. So that's why I'm here, so bright and early. But uh, I'm looking forward to an informative seminar. And uh, this gentleman works for Ted, as I mentioned, in surveillance at MGM Resorts International, which of course international the entire big global thing. Okay. Uh, Ted, Ted gave me a, a tour of the surveillance room in the ARIA uh, a couple years ago. It was fabulous. And I bumped into this guy in the hallway. That uh, real nice guy, and with no further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Rick Perazzo. Perazzo. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yes, my name is Rick Perazzo. My, my current position right now is corporate surveillance training manager for MGM Resorts. I got my start in the casino industry with MGM Resorts as a dealer. Um, Working my way up through dealing with surveillance and then eventually up into a corporate position for the entire company. So um, today I'm going to be talking about the history of playing cards, or I would say a brief history. I'm not going to go through the entire history. I'll go through as much as I can. But my main objective was to get to the bottom of where did these four suits come from, the suits we all know and love, hearts, clubs, diamonds, and spades. Uh, I wanted to know what is the origin of this. So I'm tracking it all the way back to the beginning of these suits here. Now gonna, there's a lot of branching off, I'm sure you can imagine, um, we're talking over thousands of years, or at least over a thousand years, uh, of card history, and, and things happen. You know, there, there's some, some uh, countries who would use up to 16 suits, or even 8 suits, uh, 78 cards in a deck, uh, a different number of cards, 36 cards in a deck, and all of the different deck types or, or anything like that have to do with games that were being played with the cards that were in use at the time. So, um, anyway, going back to this, all I really want to do is track back the history of the cards that we know in the <coughs> So in our story, we start off in China. Cards uh, were developed in China in the 9th century um, by uh, the Tang Dynasty. So in China in the 9th century, uh, there actually, believe it or not, there is no documentation of any card usage up until about the 13th century. And the very first document that ever existed of card usage was a court document where two people were arrested for gambling with cards. Uh, so right away, you already have a tainted history with playing cards. And, and that, that continues from the 12th century all the way up until today. Uh, this has got a bad rap cards, dude. Gambling, dice, cards, and all of those things. And we, we're all pretty familiar with that history of that side of the history. Um, so the very first document, two people arrested for gambling using cards, and also they had card manufacturing equipment. Uh, back in those days, the way they printed cards, most commonly, uh, if they wanted to print them fast, they would print them on, they would paint a wood block and then stamp it on the back of the paperboard or whatever the uh, materials they were using. Or if they wanted to be really fancy about it, they would do hand-painted cards. Um, hand-painting, of course, is a lot longer, but hand-painting was a very popular thing to do uh, back in those days. So hand-painting would have been the more um, glorious or glamorous ones, and then the, the wood block ones would have been the more standard ones. Um, so the majority of cards being printed would be from wood, card, uh, wood blocks. The cards in China, they actually held value, um, the cards themselves. They substituted for money. And the reason they did this was because they, they wanted to gamble with something, but they didn't want to necessarily use actual money to gamble with. So it was like a substitute for that. Um, so if you think of games like uh, Magic the Gathering or, or Pokemon or anything like that, where the strength of the card itself actually can defeat other cards and then the cards are more rare depending on their value, uh, all sorts of things like that. This is 
very similar to Chinese cards back in the day. Um, they had a lower value card, even the suits had value. So the, the lowest value suit and the highest value suit. All of these things uh, were taking place during that. Um, and then other games, you know, uh, I, I do talk about Magic, Magic Gathering. Now, I don't play that game, I don't know how familiar you are with that game, but the object of that game is to win other people's cards using your most powerful card and, and sort of things like that. So, um, trick taking games. So, with trick taking games, what this is, um, and I will go back to the very first trick taking game I ever played, which is called Slapjack, where you take a deck of cards and you flip them over, and any time a jack appears, first one to slap their hand on top of the stack wins that stack of cards. That's a trick. You took that trick, uh, and whoever has the most cards at the end of those 52 cards is going to win that, that round. Um, so trick-taking games, and because of that, again, the cards, we can see that every single card has a specific value, and the highest card game you play is going to take that trick. Uh, the majority of the games during the Chinese times were trick-taking games. The suits that they used, um, so I, I was talking already about how they reference money. Uh, the very lowest suit was just a coin. The next suit was going to be a string of coins, which is usually uh, maybe 20 to 30 coins on a string. That's how they would pay for things in Chinese time. They would string coins together and then hand over a string of coins for things. Um, the next thing would be a myriad of string of coins, or myriads for short. Um, many strings of coins, in other words. And then finally, tens of myriads. So a myriad in Chinese terms is, is, is exactly 10,000. So myriads, 10,000 coins. Tens of myriads would be you know, 100,000 coins. Um, and that's where we can start to see the value. And also, again, we are establishing the fact that they are substituting cash with cards. Here is a look at some of their cards, and these are our suit symbols. Coins, strings, myriads, and tens. Uh, very first card over here. And later on, as they started to add faces to the cards, the very first face cards in existence would be these right here. And these face cards are characters from a 12th century novel in China called the Water, um, the Water Margins. It, any characters from that are the ones that they put on the face card. So those are going to be our first face cards ever. Um, but you can kind of see up here, you can definitely see uh, some suits being held. If I go to this slide here, uh, same thing. So now we're looking at this is representing a coin, another coin. Um, a string of coin would look like this on a card. And then here we see the traditional Chinese symbol for the myriad, and then simplified Chinese symbol. And then this is showing us tens of myriads uh, right there. So the myriad. Um, now something about this is that over time in Chinese cards, uh, the myriads and the tens of myriads did merge together. So eventually they only did have three suits in China for a while. But the very original cards had these four suits here. Now, speaking of those wood blocks, um, how they used to print the majority of the cards, when you see a string of card or a string of um, coins like this, over time that string of coins starts to kind of get misinterpreted. People don't quite understand what it is because it's getting printed over and over and over again. Um, so what ends up happening is people start to think that that is a fish, and this becomes a fish suit for a little while. But the more common misinterpretation of the string of coins was a stick of bamboo. Which, believe it or not, is where we get the stick of bamboo on our mahjong tile. So you can see here our coins, bamboo, and our myriad. This is the traditional myriad, again, for Chinese, simplified and traditional. So our, even our uh, mahjong tiles are based off of the suits of Chinese cards. And then, furthermore, I will talk about this real quick. Now, I didn't come here to talk about dice too much, but dice is a much older game, uh, dating back to the 4th or 5th century. So what Chinese did with dice was they took two dice and then they created cards or developed cards using all the 21 possible combinations you can get with two dice. So now we have dice cards is what these are called. Um, and this is the origin of dominoes, the American dominoes that we would see, or even high gal tiles, uh, which are considered, some people call these dominoes and some people call them cards. Uh, these are high gal tiles, is what I call them anyway. But you can see these are identical to the Chinese cards. These are all 21 uh, possible combinations for two dice. So that, just kind of a little branch off there, but I thought that was pretty interesting because they were using cards at that point too. So where we go from here is over into Persia, um, traveling down the Silk Road, and we're looking at Persian cards in the 12th century. Um, these were traded pretty re 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 relatively frequently, um, coming from China over into this area. Um, and some things also, I was already talking about how we already know about this shaded history of cards. 
um, cards did not have face pictures on them, or face pictures here in the, in the Persian uh, place, because um, it was against religion to photo image any, any face, a, a real person's face on any sort of uh, thing like that. It was, it was against religion, so now we have religion that doesn't like cards, and we also have um, cultures that don't like cards, um, arresting people for gambling and everything. So they did not include face cards because it was against religion in this region. As far as chess versus cards goes, um, there are a little bit of similarities here, uh, but chess originated in this region, and already as soon as cards were introduced in this region, chess was very well established, and the culture believed that the chess game was for the noble, for the, the intelligent, for the, the smart people, whereas cards were for the lower end people, the, um, the back alleyway players, the ones who were gambling, all this stuff. Again, here we see this history. Um, chess was for knowledgeable and cards unknowledgeable people. And we don't know a lot about the types of games that they played in those Persian times, but we can assume that they are either going to be those trick-taking games, the majority of the games played at that time, or else um, a number of people would use them for divination as well. They start to use divination at this point um, in uh, Persia. This is a set of the Persian, car the Persian cards here. They're called Manlok. Um, and what we're doing here is we are taking our Chinese symbols and we are converting them into something that's more familiar to the region. Uh, we keep the coins the same, but again, remember I was saying this was often misconstrued as a bamboo stick. So what this region does is it takes a bamboo stick and turns it into a polo stick, which is a very popular game um, in this region. The cups, now this one's a little bit interesting. Um, the, the way this is explained is if you turn the myriads upside down, it looks like a chalice, it looks like a goblet. Um, and this is where this symbol gets originated from. And then tens, or the, the scimitars, uh, which are swords, um, the people at this time believed this was an indicator from China as a weapon or a sword. They didn't know that this was the Chinese character for ten. They thought it was a sword, so it resembled a sword, so they kept it the sword. But you can see, here, these are definitely hand-painted cards. They are much more elaborate than what we would have seen in China. Um, they took lots of time, uh, added lots of details to all of their cards, and again, we don't see any face cards. So I, you can probably see, after I point them out here, where the suits are. Um, there's a chalice there, a <coughs> polo stick. Uh, for the life of me, I can't recognize what a polo stick looks like, because I didn't think that's what it looked like at all, but apparently this is how we play polo. Mallets. Mallets, so yeah, that's what I was thinking. And going from the Persian area, um, next thing we're going to see is Italy. Uh, they go across the Mediterranean Sea and up into Italy. Um, and from here, Italy and along, I'm going to go ahead and say the majority of Europe around this time, it was very, very, very rapid spread once they made it to Italy. Uh, the 1370s here. Um, and a lot of the games that were played in all of Europe were all developed in Italy. And a lot of the games were also carried over to other countries as well. Um, Italy into Spain, Spain into Spanish colonies. And a number of different games were developed here in Italy using cards um, and have traveled throughout the world from there. The Ace of Coins on an Italian card is a very interesting card. Um, the Ace of Coins during the time, this time, or not long after this time, um, card manufacturers wanted to be sure, or I'm sorry, the government wanted to be sure that card manufacturers were being taxed properly for the cards that they were making. So, in order to do so, they asked the card manufacturers to put a tax stamp on one specific card, which ends up becoming the Ace of Coins in, in Italian, and in Spanish as well. I'm, just, I'm saying Italian right now, but this happens in Spain as well. Um, a, a, a tax stamp on the, uh, on the card, plus the manufacturer's license number to prove that they are eligible to print cards, because what happens during these times is a lot of counterfeit situations. People freely make cards, make them and make them and get them and sell them, and then the counterfeit ones you don't have to worry about paying taxes on. So they want to make sure that the cards that are out there being sold are legitimate cards, and because of that, we get this tax stamp. But the tax stamp um, became a work of art itself. People would take the tax stamp, and again, in order to stop from counterfeiting, they would make it more, more and more and more elaborate. Um, so, if you can think of an ace of spades, how elaborate a lot of our ace of spades are in all of our cards, this is where that originates. Over time, that was transferred from the ace of coins over to the ace of spades, and people took that opportunity to put as much artwork into their cards as they could, um, making beautiful, glorious aces of spades, all coming from this ace of coins, which comes from the tax stamp. 
Um, what I also want to pay attention to during the challenge times is the color schemes that they used here in Italy because these are what's going to carry on into our current big cards. Um, and then the suits are changed slightly as well. <clears throat> so just as an example here of a bunch of aces of spades, they all like to put their, their manufacturer's name on there still. Every once in a while you will see a license number or a serial number or a, a, a variety of different numbers, but they tend to use the ace of spades to uh, advertise all of this information. And this, believe it or not, becomes one of the most widely collected things of decks of cards is the ace of spades itself. The other one being the joker. People collect jokers and they collect aces most often. If you don't want to collect the entire deck, uh, you go for the ace of spades. And so here's what a set of Italian cards looks like. So if we move our suits over just a little bit, we can see that it's starting to um, develop into something else now. We've still got coins. We don't like polo in Italy. Uh, we like batons. We're not familiar with the game of polo, so we're going to be using batons instead. Uh, more recognizable uh, people at the time. So they are more familiar with that. It's part of the culture. Um, the cuffs change slightly, and the sword changes slightly. But keep in mind this, this word right here. Does that look familiar at all? Um, because this is where we get our suit names. Um, the sword in Italian is spades. So uh, just keep that in mind as we continue on. But also I want to talk about the coloring. Red, white, yellow, blue, black. And that is, of course, the colors of our face cards even today. Um, and the card, the, of course, the card um, coloring originated right here. And if we go on over to Spain from Italy, um, very similar times, 1370s to 1380s, cards are being played and developed here. Um, tax stamps are happening here, trademarks, all those sorts of things are also happening in Spain. Um, usually, though, in Spain, what they would do is they would use 10 or 40 to 48 cards per deck rather than 52 or, or numbers of different cards. Um, the reason being is that because it was a lot easier, the cards are printed in one giant sheet. Um, and it was easier to print 48 cards on one sheet than to print 52 cards on two sheets. You would have to use an entire extra sheet just to print four more, well, you have four more cards. So they moved it down to 48 cards instead, making it easier to print, making it easier to uh, roll out there. Um, typically, they would remove one of the number cards, usually the 10, the 10 of whatever, and they would only go from the 1 to 9. Um, sometimes they would remove the 6. They would, that really depended on the type of game that you were playing, on which card might get removed, uh, going all the way down to the 40, or even you know, at some points, 36 cards. Um, there are times that they would just re remove them. For instance, if you're familiar with the game of Euchre, um, Euchre you don't use a lot of the number of cards, you only use the, the face cards and uh, so on. So um, a lot of different games don't use every card. Cadiz pattern, which is what I'm going to show you next, um, it was developed in Spain, it was developed after something called the Spanish National Pattern, which was the widely accepted pattern at the time. Um, however, it was never used in Spain. They used that design to send out to their Spanish colonies. And I have, uh, you know, Brazil, Brazil so, uh, all over the world, Spanish colonies all over the world, and they printed these Cadiz cards specifically to go to these uh, Spanish colonies to play cards there. And here is what a deck of uh, Spanish cards look like. So coins, now we also see the batons are getting changed to these clubs. Sometimes the more elaborate clubs have leaves. And guess what? You can see where we got the name of the clubs from now, right there. Um, cups stay the same, swords uh, go straight. So say it's starting to evolve just a little bit here. Uh, something going on to, uh, oh yes, here we go, tarot. Now this is an interesting one. Uh, this is where I'm going to take up a lot of your time. Tarot cards. Um, they were invented in Italy in the early 15th century. Um, now, maybe you are familiar with tarot or you're, you're familiar with the divination aspect of tarot, which a lot of people in the United States are, and that's by design. Um, tarot is, um, you use it in an entirely deck cards that was created in Italy, but the whole mystery behind tarot is that people who will tell you tarot tell you that it ties back to ancient Egyptian times um, and they were used for divination and all that stuff. Um, and so we, we take that and, and run with it. Um, English speaking countries, not me or, or us, but the English speaking countries take this divination aspect of tarot and run with it and that it, it ends up becoming one of the most popular things that has ever happened to cards is people selling them as divination. Uh, it was a very, very successful marketing scheme. But, 
come to find out they were not even intended for divination. These cards were intended to play cards just like any other card games. Um, they were um, based off the Italian suits, and they also included one of um, an entirely new suit. Well, I mean, you wouldn't even call it a suit. It's a suit of trumps, meaning that there's an entire 22 cards that are only trump cards. They are not designated to any specific suit, and they beat any other card, and then those trump cards are going to be numbered as well. Um, so the reason that they are so so widely used for divination is because they're very beautiful cards, and they they're uh, by this time that they're being created, everything is about art. Uh, it's all about having pocket-sized art. You know, people could carry a deck of cards and, and literally have a pocket full of art and then show their cards to people. So these tarot cards become very, very elaborate, very well painted, um, beautiful designs. But because you can have these beautiful designs, people start to read into all of the pictures that are going on in these cards. Um, and then they say, well, this, you know, this picture here actually means this. So um, we can start to see how this divination aspect develops. Uh, but they were not ever intended for divination. They were only intended to play cards with that uh, that trump suit to be able to supersede any other card in the deck. And here's just an example. So tarot uh, derives from the word, uh, the Italian word tarachi. And although there is no origin for the word tarachi, um, the word tarach in Italian means foolish. So. <laughs> there you go. So if we look at an entire deck of tarot cards, uh, let's move our suits over just a little bit, we still see um, coins, these are also known as tentacles or discs in tarot. No, just, um, the wands, because again we're going on a more mystical theme now, I was looking for wands my instead of clubs or baton, um, cups or chalices or goblets, and then also the swords are still there. Uh, but I, this again, this is an entire deck, if I point out certain cards, um, now this is a beautiful deck right here. Um, so you can see what I'm talking about, how you can read into, into these pictures. For example, if you are doing this for divination, what will typically happen is the tarot card drawer will draw you three cards, and then based on whatever the pictures are in those three cards, they're going to tell you something about your future. So if you draw this card here, this is actually just the Nine of Swords, meaning we already know what a Nine of Swords looks like from Italian and Spanish cards. This is a Nine of Swords. We've got Nine Swords here, but the picture tells us it means that you have too many thoughts that are keeping you up at night. You have things that are not allowing you to sleep. You have things hanging over your head, in other words. And, and again, this is how we get this divination aspect. The seven of heart, or the seven of um, cups, shows you you have too many options in front of you. You don't know which one to select, so you are confused. Um, this right here, these are trump cards. These are this is going to be the magician, which is the, the supreme trump, the number one trump. Um, and what we see here on on the magician card is you can see every suit. You see the the, dot, the um, you know, coins, and then the sword, and the baton, and the wand, and then he's got the chalice right here, the cup. Um, this one here, Temperance, <coughs> what's interesting about Temperance uh, is she has one foot in the water. Now in tarot, water indicates emotion, uh, flowing, ever flowing. So water, she's got one foot in the water, but she also has one foot planted firmly on the, the earth, the ground. Uh, so we've got water, earth, um, but she does have wings if she decides to fly away, so now we've got that air element coming in. So you can read a lot of things, um, and temperance is all about you know tempering yourself and not you know over overdoing anything. So a lot of just stuff, and that's again why these things are so good for divination, and it's fun to do. Um, I learned a lot about tarot in a very short amount of time, and I was mystified. And then two days later, I was deflated to find out that it wasn't for, for tarot or for uh, divination at all. So moving away from Spain, let's go over into Germany and Switzerland. Alright, so uh, same thing, right around the same time, late 1370s, um, first record of existence. Um, here we only have about 36 cards per deck, and also the 10 is going to be what's considered a banner card, meaning like we have our ace of spades as our, our banner card, is where all that beautiful information is. The 10 of the, 10 of, uh, the deck would be considered the banner where they put all the information on there. Um, Several suits here. They tried many, many different. So this right here is. They had you know hundreds of different suits at one time or another in Switzerland and Germany. Um, but the majority of their themes always had to do with more rustic things. Um, talking about hunting. You know, you can. They would have dogs or ducks or helmets or shields or you know, a number of different things. Roses, um, leaves, all sorts of just 
rustic outdoor activity having to do with hunting. And then they finally settled on four of the suits that they wanted to keep, which are going to be our bells, acorns, flowers, and shields in Switzerland. So that bell indicates a hawk's bell. Uh, you typically tie this to the neck of a hawk that they go flying around and get your ear pray for you. Um, you can hear where they are. So a hawk bell, um, acorns, again, all, the, all these outdoor rustic activities. So if you think of other types of cars, we'll talk about the Spanish and the Italian ones. Those would be more militant, where we've got you know, swords and weapons and things. Um, and then this is going to be our rustic. If I look at, um, so you can see, of course, the bells, the flowers, the shields, and then the acorns. Uh, something else I want to point out here, though, is that we also see that we have four court cards. This is a very common thing to happen in Europe, a, a, a number of different court cards. Sometimes they only use two, sometimes they use four. When they use four, tarot deck uses four, for instance. Um, you would have the lowest one being a page or a valet or a, a, a servant. Um, the next one up would be a knight, and knights are very common um, in, in any, four, any, any four court suit, you would have a knight. Um, the next one would be a queen, and the next one is a king. Now, there are many, many times throughout European history where the queen is going to be the most powerful card in the deck. Um, it, it all depends on what is happening in, in their uh, situation at the time that the card is being played. Sometimes the queen was more powerful. So, um, cards will reflect that as well. And if we look at going from Switzerland over to Germany, now we take our bell, keep those bells, acorns, uh oh, look what we got. And then also we have leaves. Um, so does this, rec does this look familiar to anybody, uh, what suit I might be talking about right there? Yes, yeah, a little bit. And this one too, very easy to tell which one I'm talking about. Um, and here are an example of German cards, we have hearts, acorns, leaves, and bells. And then this is going to be, um, where's my banner card? I, I might not have a banner card here, so anyway. Oh, oh, you know what, did I to tell you, show you that ace of coins I did, didn't I? Uh, where it's got the tax stamp on it. Anyway, hold on. So, from there, let's travel over to France, which brings us to the cards that we know and love, the hearts, clubs, diamonds, and spades. They first became popular and simplified in France thanks to new printing technologies they were using in France. Because they could print cards so rapidly, they spread rapidly, and that's why they are so extremely popular even to this day, um, the, the French cards. Um, <clears throat> just the, just the um, extreme amount that they were able to churn out all the time. But in order to do something like that, what they, the first thing they had to do was simplify things. So instead of having elaborate swords or cups or anything like that, we take four suits, we simplify them, and not only that, one, but we use uh, two colors, red and black, red and black, and those because that's because those are the most easily readily available inks that we could be using in France at the time. The red and the black that are the least expensive, the most easy to get. Um, so you don't have to worry about looking for ink or anything in order to print these things rapidly. Uh, they stick with red and black and they simplify the actual look of the card themselves to make it easier to print. Um, it increased mainly to, yeah, it's like, was that talking about that? So, um, and the Portuguese are the ones who are responsible for our current card names. Uh, what they did was they took French suits and then they added Spanish and Italian names to them. So we saw the clubs and we saw the, um, the spades. Um, so they took those names and, and assigned them here. So here's our French deck right here. And there's our final evolution. Our bells become diamonds. Clubs, which uh, in France is what we call a fleur de lis or a flower, um, becomes, it's a club because we know that that was a club back in Spanish times. Um, the heart is heart and then the spades is our Italian word for sword. Um, so here it is again, here's our tax stamp and our, our manufacturer's logo, but also keep in mind we've got the red, white, yellow, blue, and black over here. So um, this brings me to that portion of the, uh, the presentation, how we got to our, our normal car. So if, before I move on, do you have any questions about anything I've brought up so far? Yes? Um, the early Chinese cards, do they exist at all at this point? You can, yes, you can still buy them. Um, they will, they reprint them, of course, in today's, um, with today's technology, they, they'll put them on paperback or, or um, you know, whatever, whatever you make cards up short, but you can still get them. Amazing. Yeah. I've got another question, too. Sure. It's interesting that uh, it was the 1370s that this was uh, adopted in, in Europe, because that's during the time of the Black Plague. 
Yes. And does that mean people are more indoors or hiding or? Yeah, yeah. Know, actually, that's probably good, that's probably a good correlation. Yeah, yeah they, they have they're they're bored because they're stuck inside, kind of like we were three years ago, um, and we were on the internet for for six months. I guess that's the equivalent. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I would think so. Yeah, okay. a way to pass the time. Any other questions? All right, so. As far as who our cards are named after, and as a matter of fact, they are named after historical figures. Um, the ones I found most interesting was that the Jack of Diamonds, or the King of Diamonds, is Julius Caesar. I think that's pretty interesting. And then also, Sir Lancelot is going to be our Jack of Clubs. Uh, so here we're kind of looking at knights. Uh, or we, we call them Jacks now, but they would be considered knights um, at that time. Now, something interesting, there's uh, some biblical characters up here, so even though religion doesn't like cards, we still use some of their characters for our cards. Uh, Rachel, Judith, and um, King David. Uh, Argyne is an interesting one. This is not an actual person, Argyne. Um, Argyne is a anagram for the word Regina, which is a uh, different language for the word queen. Um, queen, and Regina, Regine, um, and then now we take those letters and create a name out of that called Argyne. This is supposed to be Mary Angelou, I think that was her name, um, but it's not a real representation of her. The, it, the name is an Argan. As a matter of fact, if you go down to Fremont Street today and go to the Four Queens and you go to get their collector's coins, you will see these four names on four different coins. Uh, I was fascinated by that. I have those coins and, and I happened to see that while I was doing this, uh, this research here and I said, well, I'll be darn. They are. They are named Rachel Argan, Judith, and um, Pallas. So, uh, just very interesting to me. If you want to go down there after this, uh, uh, it, you, know, you know the um, the slot machine I'm talking about that you can win those coins out of it, right? Um, so, with, so when, did this, when did this come about? Uh, this, this naming convention? Yeah. Gosh, I don't know. It was. It was. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you the exact date, but it was. Well, for instance, this is King Charlemagne, which is the first king of France. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine probably somewhere shortly thereafter. Um, That's what I like. This, this, this is so interesting. Yeah, this to me was one of the most. Interesting. But this one here, I was really. I, I'm. This is my new favorite card, just because I, I was always a fan of King Arthur times, and so um, that was interesting to me. And this one too. Yeah, I, I thank you for saying so. All right. So going on from France, the next place we're going to be looking at. I guess I wasn't done. Um, is the United Kingdom. Uh, United Kingdom, and here. Um, what happens, of course, is they are imported from France, um, but not for very long. Once cars became popular in the United Kingdom, they stopped import. They started banning imports of cars. They wanted to make them themselves and sell their own cars to their own people. Um, they would freely export them, but they were no longer import cars. Um, cars, again, banned by royalty. Uh, royalty would not allow the peasants to play cards. It was against the law for peasants to play cards. At the same time, royalty was playing cards in their castles. <laughs> Yeah, it makes perfect sense. It was to do as I say, not as I do. Um, also, uh, cars in, in the United Kingdom were sometimes used to educate people. So they would put educational information, they would put maps of towns on them, or, or teach people how to read using little short sentences and paragraphs, and use playing cards to teach people information. Um, and this is going to come in interesting too, in the second I talk about the United States. But um, yeah, sharing information or, or keeping people educated using playing cards. Which again will bring me over to the United States. And we brought, well we brought, we being the Puritans, brought cards to the United States in the 1600s, uh, talking about the, the black plate, um, for something to do once they got to the new land, uh, play cards. Um, so they brought along with them, and they became extremely popular in the United States. Um, and they were often used in the military, even going back to the Civil War times, all the way up to Desert Storm, and probably even later. Um, they would hide maps, battle maps, battle plans in a deck of cards, pass them out to the soldiers on the field, um, and they would have that information in front of them. What we also do with cards, especially during World War II, is we change the suits from Hearts Club Diamond Spades to Allied versus Enemy. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see, right here. 
Allied versus enemy artillery. So they put battleships, what a Japanese battleship looks like versus an American battleship, and each one is going to be a different suit. They use airplanes. What does the United Kingdom airplane with our ally airplane look like? What does our enemy airplane look like? And they put them on the decks of cars themselves so that players, being soldiers, will be able to recognize those in the battlefield and not shoot down the wrong planes or shoot down the correct plane or hit the right boat. Um, all, all in an attempt to keep them educated on who their enemy is. Um, and going all the way to Desert Storm, that deck of cards that uh, you might remember from the early 90s, um, the 52 most wanted terrorists over yes. in Iraq, Desert Storm. Yeah. Um, same exact reason, because they wanted to put those faces in front of the soldiers um, to be readily available if they recognize that face. By playing with those cards, we're going to be able to recognize these people um, more quickly. So the whole purpose behind that, of course, was to for repetition and for memorization. Uh, and it comes back from uh, all of this here, using cards to educate people. And also talking about the Joker. Um, the Joker was used in and out of several different decks of cards throughout the centuries. The uh, United States reintroduces the Joker, and believe it or not, the word Joker originates from the word Euchre. This is actually um, a American version of the word Euchre, uh, the Joker is. Um, and we use the Joker to become the supreme bower in our game of Euchre. Uh, if you're not familiar with Euchre, the Jack of Spades is the highest card. Well, now we have a Joker, which is higher than the Jack of Spades. So, um, just something that we, and then now the Joker is extremely popular. We always have, you know, either 53 or 54 cards in our decks, because we'll have one or two Jokers in there. And once again, here is the evolution of our suits, just so you can see the Chinese ones compared to the French ones. Sure. <laughs> I saw you earlier, so I didn't want to stop. I, mean, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. And oh, before I switch pages, um, I, again, I was talking about how a lot. There's going to be lots of branches at all of these stages. I just wanted to track our suits back to the beginning of their um, history. So. Uh, I did that on purpose. I didn't. I didn't go into the dogs or the ducks or the giraffes or anything like that. All right, so current day cards now. Um, let's talk about some of the security features that we offer on our current day cards. First of all, the patterns on the back. Yes, that is a security feature. Um, and the patterns on the back dates back just so that as, as far as cards do. The whole purpose for the pattern on the back at that time was so that it made it difficult to be able to see through the cards because the paper was very thin. And if the players were holding their cards up, you'd be able to see through them. So by putting a pattern on the back, they're camouflaging whatever the face of the card is. Um, nowadays, the pattern on the back will also prevent you from seeing scuffs or marks or things that might. So that's typically why we won't use um, clear backed or clean backed cards, plain backed cards, because they do prevent people from being able to see scuffs that they might be able to identify cards more quickly. Yes, it's still possible to mark cards using substances and things like that, but you know, through the normal course of play, cards will get scuffed up and marked up. Um, and with patterns on the back, we can kind of stop that from uh, being as noticeable. The logos on the back of the card. So um, this, uh, now this is my boss, Mr. Ted Whiting, telling me and, and uh, telling me that the reason for the logos is so that we in surveillance can identify whether or not the dealer is properly dealing out the next card. Uh, back in the day when they were doing handheld games, sometimes it was called dealing seconds, where the dealer would deal not the top card off the deck, they would deal the second from the top card and hold that top card for one of their players. Um, so, by putting a logo on the back, we can see that that top card is legitimately being dealt like it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a fair game for both the players and the casino. Uh, and by putting that logo on the back, we're going to be able to see that that proper card is getting dealt. <coughs> rounded corners go way back to uh, centuries as well. Um, the reason for the rounded corners is because if you use sharp edged corners, they wear out more frequently and it's going to be able to expose the value of the card a lot more easier. So if you round them out instead, um, the cards won't get worn down as quickly. As far as layers, and I don't know if you are familiar with this or not, but this card actually has three layers to it. Um, the face, and then there's a middle layer, and then there's the back layer right here. So three layers. That middle layer is what I'm going to talk about, though. It's, a, it's actually this very black, thin film. It, or very thin black film. Um, and it's, it's sandwiched in between the other two layers, and that is to prevent any sort of light source from protruding through that card. Yes, again, there's, there's lots of cheating technologies out there. It's probably still possible, but it's 
a lot less likely by having that third layer in there to prevent a lot of things from being seen through it. Um, the very, if you were to tear one of the cards open, you would be able to see that. Then. But it would typically would have to be coming from a casino. Uh, they don't always use that light layer, but it's part of our security measures here. Um, barcodes. Uh, a lot of the shoes that we have on our Baccarat games nowadays, um, they can read the cards as they're coming out. And what they'll do is typically on the very edge of the card, like sometimes even on the side of the card itself, like you know this, this little thin layer, they'll have a barcode there and that is getting read by the shoe as it's coming out. And then that shoe can prevent the dealer from inadvertently dealing extra cards for that round. They of course do have to press buttons and everything to make sure that they can clear that after it's done. Um, but it's all using barcodes or sometimes there will be a barcode down in the corner right here as well. Uh, you might see those too. Um, UV images. So if you held up a black light to some of our cards, you would be able to see a UV image printed on the back, and you would only be able to see it using a black light. And that is to verify, of course, that those are our cards that are coming off of that game. And we also have plastic coatings on, especially poker cards. Uh, as any, if, any, if any of you are poker players, you'll know that there is, those cards are very durable. They last for weeks. They can use the same deck of cards for a number of weeks uh, before being retired. In table games, um, not so much. They, they will typically change cards maybe every eight hours or every 24 hours if they're trying to save money. Um, they don't last that long there, but poker cards, yes, they do last a lot longer, and that's because they have a plastic coating on both sides. You can spill a drink on there and just wipe it off and off you go, kind of like a, a, mat, or a, a menu at a restaurant where you have those laminated uh, restaurant menus. It's very similar to that. You just wipe them off and they're, they're good. They're very durable, very useful, but because they don't change them out that often, we're much more susceptible to card switching, um, introducing foreign cards into that deck because the, the security features aren't as robust, I guess I should say, as uh, some of our table games cards. And the reason I put this up here um, is because this is my favorite collection of cards right here. I just got this a couple months ago. I got it actually from the uh, Gambler General Store. I was just talking about that store. Um, and what it is, of course, is Harry Potter cards. Um, they are the house representatives of each house in that movie. Um, so, but what I like about it is the artwork in them. They're very, very elaborately designed. And I had already talked about how people love to carry around pocket folds of artwork you know, back in the early centuries. Similar thing going on here. Um, card manufacturers are more and more, you know, souvenir cards, um, talking about it, pretty much any, any, any person or any company that you can think of probably has a deck of cards, Pepsi, Mountain Dew, you know, Doritos, anything you can think of, there's probably at least one deck of cards with that logo on the back of it. They're very common to make, um, what, what is that called? Um, you know, just, just souvenir cards for, for a certain manufacturer, even people will print them for like a, an outing or something. You know, they'll, they'll just do things. Um, and, and that's what brings me to these cards here. Uh, even, even movies, uh, books, all a number, anything you can think of is going to have a deck of cards assigned to it at some point or another. Um, but talking about that with those Pepsi cards or, or anything like that um, is going to be the flaw of having a one directional back of the card. Um, so now I'm going to quick talk, talk, quick, quick, quickly talk about how to sort cards, um, this is called, this is the form of advantage play that we find in uh, surveillance. Sorting cards has to do with assigning high and low value cards to a certain um, back of the card. So what I mean here by one directional is that they are not, they're asymmetrical in other words. Here we have the star, this is asymmetrical, um, there, there, and there. So what you can do with this information is you sort the cards between high value and low value cards depending on the game that you're playing, and then you simply turn them upside down, and now this can be a low card. So the next time these cards come into play, if it's right side up, you know it's a high value card. If it's upside down, you know it's a low value card. So here's a little trick for you. If you play poker at home, take a deck of cards like this, turn all the aces upside down, and you'll know if anybody has an ace. You get your orange side up for aces, and then blue side up for all the other cards. Thank you. Yes? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so, so high cards, low cards. I think you can see where I'm going with that one. Um, as a matter of fact, in the uh, <laughs> poker nuts are just a lot more interesting. You will, get, you will get yours in the end if you actually do that. I believe in the comma. I have that card right here. Uh, I just bought this deck of cards um, just a couple months ago at Walgreens. They do exist. It's all about finding an asymmetry in the back of the cards that you can exploit. Um, so, 
I'm sorry, I, I know I walked away over there. But, um, uh, so, how do we use that in real casino cards? It, clearly, it must be impossible with these cards, right? Um, they're they're bi-directional, they're symmetrical. Uh, the problem is these are actually not symmetrical cards. Not even the cards that we use in casinos currently are symmetrical. Uh, if I point out the fact that one side here has a set of full green diamonds and then one side has a set of half green diamonds, same thing, I'm doing this high value versus low value. If I want this to be a high card, I keep my full diamond on the left hand side. If I want it to be a low card, um, I just turn it 180 degrees and now my half diamond is going to be over here. And then the next time these cards come into play, based on this edge, which would be the edge that's poking out of the shoe as the dealer's dealing the cards, I'm going to know if it's a low value or high value card. Uh, even something as simple as this. Um, now, as far as why do, why do we have this sort of asymmetry in the back of our cards? Well, if you have a product card like Pepsi, um, clearly that's going to be a unit one direction card. Um, casino cards, they do have the symmetry with the logos, um, but printing, being able to print this pattern on the back of a sheet of 52 cards and make it symmetrical every single time that that cut comes down is it's almost impossible. The, the, the way that those cards get cut, they are cut out of a sheet of 52 cards, um, and that at some point that pattern is going to become asymmetrical. Um, and that happens with, they've tried many, many different patterns. You sometimes, there's a lot of different sorts of, these are called diamondback cards. You see a lot of different diamondback cards out there, many different diamond shapes. Sometimes they have little triangles, all sorts of things, circles sometimes. Um, but the, the problem is the way that they're printed causes an asymmetry in the back of them. And to cap this thing off, explaining what each suit actually means. So this is throughout the course of history. Um, the ones that I am most interested in here are the elements, so our earth, and then down here, the class, the merchant class for our diamonds, which symbolizes money. Um, oh, I need to tell you about why these became diamonds. It's because they, they originally they turned that coin into a tile, um, and then the tile got tilted and got turned into a diamond. So it was just a square at one time. Um, and then it got tilted and turned into a diamond. Um, coming over to the clubs, uh, lock, love, but we have fire and we have peasants for our peasants class. There was a time in European history where the club suit was the strongest suit because the peasants had overtaken the kingdom. Um, and this became the strongest suit during that time. <clears throat> and we've got hearts, which includes love, emotion, um, water elements, and our clergy class, and finally our spades with justice, death, uh, our air element, and our royalty or military. Um, so, if anybody ever asks you from this point forward, if the cards, if the suits have value, you can tell them yes, and you can tell them which one is the most expensive card, the strongest card, and that's going to be your spades. Uh, going all the way back to Chinese times, our tens of myriads there. So. Least valuable card, least valuable suit, most valuable suit. So you have the answer to that at long last. There is such thing as values to the suit. So let's see. I guess that's going to be it. So any other questions um, for this presentation? Yes? Question. Like over the last 20, 30 years with all the technology and advancements that have gone into printing the cards for security purposes, how has that impacted the cost of the casinos to print those cards and purchase them? The casinos, um, they, they are very inexpensive for the casinos. They, um, I don't know, it, 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 we're talking like cents um, per card or cents per deck perhaps. Not, not very much um, with the technologies in there. They, they, they are put in there by the card manufacturers themselves. They're not, we, they're not things that we are paying for them to do. Um, they are already included in those cards. Um, so they aren't very expensive. Uh, something else about the, that actually I should bring up is that the reason we cannot find a way to symmetrically make that pattern on the back is because according to, again, to my bosses, um, we, as, as in the casinos, are not the biggest industry for cards, believe it or not. We don't buy as many cards as Walmarts and Walgreens and, um, and, and all those other people who are manufacturing their own cards. Those are the ones to be their larger customers. I really have a hard time believing that casinos don't buy enough cards to be able to change that pattern, but that's, um, that's what I'm told and I like to believe my boss. What kind of games are using chips and cards so they can be bred? 
Um, well, Baccarat, uh, definitely Baccarat, you can do that very easily uh, because Baccarat is, there's no decision making involved, so there will be a time where the cards need to be stopped being dealt when the hand is over. Uh, on a Baccarat game, it's going to be, every round is going to be either four to six cards, um, and depending on whether or not one of the hands drew a, a third card is going to depend on if that second hand is going to draw a third card as well. And those rules stay in place. It's called the third card rule. And that can be programmed into a computer and it can stop the cards from being dealt inadvertently. Uh, but blackjack, um, there's decision making involved. You can't stop the cards from being dealt because you don't know if the player wants to hit or stand or surrender or anything like that. So because of the decision making aspect on a blackjack game, you can't stop the cards from being dealt. I remember hearing years ago when they first started using the uh, chips into poker cards so that they'd have the TV shows. Oh, yeah. Game, that those decks were starting to cost $50 plus a deck. Is that yes. still true or did yes. it come down? Yeah, they probably would have come down a little bit by, by now with uh, increased technology, emerging technology. Um, but yes, I, now I know what you're talking about, those types of cards, sure. Um, the, the RFID chips in there to make it easier to read the cards. Um, I, the, the example I was using was just a simple barcode printed on the back, but yeah, the chip card, for sure those are going to be a lot more expensive, um, that sort of technology. But you, you, you're familiar as chip collectors of that RFID chip in a lot of our gaming chips, same exact technology that they use there. They're going to be able to read the value of that chip, uh, running it over that black scanner. Um, same thing with those, those types of cards as well. Um, yeah, so it does look be more expensive. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? I just want to say it's excellent. Talk. Oh, thank you.